Smith, who passed it in a variety of places, is now a professor at, uh, Phila at Philadelphia, yeah, Pensacola Christian College, <laughs> graduated from Philadelphia. Anyway, I was trying to convince him that he caught me the one day I don't wear a tie, and Jim Russo, being far too honest, says, if you'd worn a tie, it would have been the one day you do wear one. <laughs> Every once in a while, this church stands on the, on the scripture, we believe the Bible from the first word of Genesis to the last word of Revelation. We believe that God created. This is not an evolutionary church. We take the Bible at its word. And I spent a lot of time, at least a few minutes every Sunday morning, talking about creation. Sometimes I give examples of creation, examples of why evolution doesn't work, examples of why creation is the only scientifically possible option. For those of you that don't know me, I was a scientist for 31 years, research physicist with the Navy. Well, here's another guy that's a lot smarter than me. I'm going to, once in a while, I think it's important that we take time to identify those people in science that are creationists because if you listen to evolutionists, even in your local high school, they will tell you no viable, legitimate scientist will accept the concept of creation. All scientists are evolutionists. That's what they will tell you. Well, they're full of what the little Oscar Mayer kid sings about. In between the lines, that's baloney. Here's a young man. His name is Joe Sebony. He is a rocket scientist. He actually is still, he's quite young, younger than myself, which I suppose doesn't make you young, but he is younger than myself. And it, it says here he really is a rocket scientist. He spends time, as he says, making telephone poles fly. And that's what a rocket is. It's a telephone pole that is able to fly. He has two earned degrees from MIT, a bachelor's degree in physics and a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering, which he earned before the age of 19. Aren't too many people that can claim that. The age of 19, I was just starting. 19 years old, had two degrees from MIT. By the time he was 21, he had a master's degree in electrical engineering from UNH, where, where she earned her master's degree. But he says, the only scientifically logical position to take relative to the origins of the world and people is creation. He goes on to say, we spend millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, and loads of intelligent man hours making something work that is it's a rocket that is nowhere near as complex as, for example, a bird. He goes on to say that the guidance system that he designed for our rockets, he's the designer of the guidance system, pales in insignificance compared to the guidance system of a peregrine falcon, for example. And I agree with that, 100%. They ask him, well, with someone like yourself who is a rocket scientist, dealing in the world of hard science all the time, what do you do about people that tell you that, well, we've proven the world is billions of years old? And I've mentioned this before in some other creation moments. He says, the same thing that I've said, no, it doesn't. Science tells me it's impossible to age date anything without knowing something about the history. You have to have a starting point. There are two major assumptions you have to make. You know what the radioisotope was and the stuff when you started, and you know how fast it's gone for the last billions of years. Terrible assumptions. You don't know what it was when you started, you have to assume, and you don't know that the reaction rate is constant. Those are two very major assumptions. You cannot date radio isotope fashion the earth. So they ask him, well then why do so many people do it? In fact, somebody asked me that recently. He says, 2 Peter chapter 3, we've made ourselves willingly ignorant. We have refused to believe the obvious. He goes on to say, the problem here with the evolution creation issue is time. You see, if you give something enough time, you can convince yourself that anything can happen. He had one, of, one supervisor at, at NASA that said, had a sign on the wall that said, nothing, let's see, how did this go? I can't find the quote now. Hmm, I can't find the quote, those lines. 
Well, he said, if, if, you, if we can do anything, okay, anything that man imagines he can do, therefore nothing is impossible. You take that to its logical sequence and add time into the picture, then nothing is also ridiculous. And that is exactly what has happened with the evolution creation issue. Nothing has become ridiculous when you've added enough time to it. Now, here's a man that has two degrees from MIT before he was 19 years old, a master's from UNH in electrical engineering, works as a rocket scientist, active today, designed the guidance system used on, I can't, I don't, can't find the rocket, but on any particular rocket, and he says the only logical scientific conclusion that one can come to get that scientific, not religious, conclusion that one can come to about origins is creation. Now I shared this creation moment this morning just to give you a little bit of information, a little bit of encouragement about the fact that people that believe in creation are not non-scientists. You're going to be told at Biddeford High School when you start in the fall, some of you here are starting in the fall, that a real scientist wouldn't accept creation. Well, here's an example of someone that is a real scientist, and I would challenge you to ask your teacher if they managed to get two degrees by the time they were 18 from MIT. Here's a scientist that's a... Do it nicely, though. <laughs> here's a scientist that is a genius, and he says, scientifically, not religiously. You see, evolution is a religion. You have to have a lot of faith to believe in something that you know from observation is false. Scientifically, Creation is the only option. Thank you. One of the things that you'll be confronted with if you talk about creation and this evolution-creation debate that's, that's constantly going on now between Satan and God's people, and that's what it is. It's a satanic debate. Because there's not a scientist in the universe that no, does not know deep in his heart that the kind of information contained in a single cell of any living thing is a hundred kabillion, I don't know how big kabillion is, but it sounds nice, is a hundred kabillion times more information than... than then it could possibly arise by chance. Actually, no information can arise by chance. One of the things you will be told is, well, but the Bible says in the creation story that God had everything eating stuff that was not alive. And it says, And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed upon the face of all the earth and every tree, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So you would be told, well, you see, right away, even if Noah's Ark was big enough, for example, to put all the animals on, you still have a problem with the creation story, evolutionists would say, because lions evolved to be carnivores, and sheep evolved to be herbivores. That means lions eat meat, sheep eat grass and things. And you'll be told, well, that's, see, that's silly. This, this story is silly. Well, this story is God's word, and it is the foundation of true science, and it is 100% correct. And I want to share two things with you. One I shared with you before, but I'll do it again to remind you. Picture here of the lion that would not eat meat. Little stories like this are, are very disturbing to evolutionists. These people had a lion named Little Tyke. Little Tyke was a movie star. If any of you saw the movie Elsa years and years ago, Little Tyke was Elsa. You see, Little Tyke was an herbivore. They were told constantly by veterinarians, you've got to feed your lion meat because lions can't live on vegetables. They'd feed Little Tyke meat and Little Tyke would get sick. Little Tyke could only eat vegetables. And Little Tyke thrived on vegetables. So here's an example of an animal that maybe, after all, did not evolve to be a carnivore. Maybe it became a carnivore because it's easier to catch weak wildebeest, for example, than it is to go pick fruit from a tree if you're a lion. Right? So right away you've just shot a great big hole in the evolutionary position that carnivores evolved to be carnivores. Here is a carnivore 
that only ate meat. And by the way, I think you would share my feeling if I was going to be in a movie with a lion, I would rather be with little tyke who eats only vegetables than with a carnivore. Well, I shared this with you a long time ago, but this is something a little new. Now there's, there's a cute little picture here. It won't show, but it shows a, 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 a sheep that obviously looks guilty. Sheep eat grass, right? Okay. Well, here's a sheep that likes... Let's see, what, what bird is it? Uh, grouse, partridge. Here's a sheep that was witnessed by the shepherd to sneak up on and kill a partridge and then devour the partridge, leaving nothing but a little pile of feathers behind. So this is what you would call a really bad boy sheep, right? <laughs> well, it wasn't a fluke. I know the last time I did that, I got Adam and Josh going. Yeah, this, this, this was not a fluke. The shepherd watched this. This was reported, in, in, by the way, in England, in the Herald Sun. The shepherd watched over the period of a few more months, and this sheep would frequently, it would, became his favorite meal. He would sneak up on a partridge, and somehow this sheep, cute little fuzzy white woolly thing, figured out a way to kill the partridge and then eat it. Well, this is contrary to the evolutionary position, isn't it? They would say that this sheep evolved to be an herbivore, and by evolution, therefore, right now, should not have any desire to eat a bird at all. But in the creation story that we have from God, which is the way that it happened, both sheep and lions originally were intended to eat, as I said, reading in Genesis, the green things and nuts and fruits and things off trees and green things. The reason that they became carnivores, the reason the lion became carnivore, is the very same reason that this sheep has become, what's the word for one that's a carnivore and a vegetable eater? Omnivore. Omnivore, I guess. The reason that this sheep is on its way to becoming a carnivore. Sin in a fallen world. In a perfect world as God created it, little type would be normal, not unusual. In a sinful world as God created, as God didn't create it, but as God allowed it to become through the, the, the fall of sin of man, a sheep eating a partridge is not unusual because we live in a fallen world. So there's two examples right there. So if anybody tries to tell you from the evolutionary perspective of things, it's obvious you, you klutz that carnivores evolved into carnivores and herbivores evolved into herbivores. You can point out, well, wait a minute. I think the Bible story is true. And as a matter of fact, there was a lion that made the movies a very short time ago that could eat nothing but herbs, nothing but vegetables. So think about that. Think about the glorious creator that you have. And remember, when you listen to Discover Channel or National Geographic, what you're dealing with is a fallen world. Thank you. A horse. At least that's what I call it. Uh, my daughter doesn't call it that. She calls them something that sounds like a horse. I have a hard time pronouncing that. But this is a horse. A horse. A great big animal that runs fast. Horses are interesting. The, the way they're, they're built kind of different. They have a very large body with a large lung cavity. They're made to run for long periods of time. They, they were a weapon of war at one time. They were also a, a, a travel mechanism. At, a, at a, another time in a slightly past history. Several thousand years. <laughs> well, yeah, for a long, long time. They've got f legs that are very, very long, a great big body. But one of the things that scientists were puzzled about for quite a while, they have about a, well, a two-foot tendon attached a little short. The muscles, I want to get this right because it's, it's, it's a quarter inch. A little short muscle blob that's a quarter inch next to the bone. Scientists thought that was vestigial. That means you don't need it no more. It's, uh, that, there used to be a big list of vestigial organs when I was in school back in the 50s. There was something in the neighborhood of 200 vestigial organs. Tonsils were vestigial. Your appendix was vestigial. Now, I, I did a creation moment a short time ago. If you remember, we talked about the appendix, the fact that it's not vestigial. It's very necessary. You can get along without it. You can get along without a lot of things. I, I don't have my tonsils, but they do a function. 
and the appendix has a function relative to protection of the autoimmune of the immune system, not autoimmune, the immune system. Well, this little quarter-inch chunk of muscle on the horse, it turns out, provides the elasticity for the tendons. If the muscle was not there, computer modeling now shows that the tendons would overheat and rupture. That little quarter inch of muscle provides the stretch that is necessary to prevent this galloping huge animal that weighs even more than I do, uh, like about 1,400 pounds total, running across hard packed ground. If it wasn't for that little quarter inch of muscle, the animal would be useless. That's indicative of design, not something that's vestigial, not something that's left over, and by the way, Vestigial wouldn't help an evolutionist anyway. You guys that are going to schools, we've got some kids starting high school now, others maybe going into middle school shortly, you're going to be told right up front when you get into science classes about vestigial organs and how this proves evolution. Proves no such thing, it's going the wrong direction. Vestigial means you used to have it, now it's going away, which means you've lost information. What you really need to find to prove evolution is what's called a nascent, a nascent organism or organ that's going up. That's an organ that's gotten a little more complex, that has never been seen. Never ever been seen. So vestigial doesn't help at all. It means you're losing. It means that it used to have a function and we don't know what the function is now, so we figure you don't need it. But there's an interesting quote from a doctor here, Dr. Neil Alexander, who is an evolutionist. He says, hmm, this article was in Nature magazine. This makes us wonder whether other vestiges are as useless as they seem. Good comment by an evolutionary doctor. Makes us all wonder, I would hope. Because you don't know what something does, doesn't mean that it doesn't have a function. I know when I was in the Navy, guys probably seen some of these. I used to see signs all over the place when I visited various shipyards. If you don't know what it does, don't touch it. And it showed a guy touching something with a hammer coming down on his head or something. Just because you don't know what it does doesn't mean that it doesn't do something. So when you get into your classes or you read Geographic or you listen to the Discover Channel and you hear that key word, vestigial, as an attempt to prove to you evolution, please think back to this and say, wait a minute, how do you know it doesn't have a function? How, what makes you so smart that you believe that it doesn't have a function because you don't know what it does? Maybe it has a function. That's point number one. Point number two, but sir, teacher, professor, sir, uh, isn't that going the wrong direction? Just ask a very innocent question. Excuse me, doesn't vestigial mean that it's going the wrong way? Doesn't vestigial mean that you've lost something, which is a loss of information? Just ask those two questions. <laughs> See how popular you are. <laughs> Think about this. Every time that we do discover what used to be considered a vestigial thing, like this little one quarter inch muscle on this gigantic animal called a hoss, I still say it's a hoss, every time we find a function or a use for it, we realize the designer is an awesome designer indeed. It almost seems ludicrous to be a scientist and to accept evolution in this day and age with what we know. Think about it. Thank you. I have here, let's say, I've got a, a container. It's got some, some nuts, some bolts, plastic, two pieces of metal, some wire, some cloth, and I'll even put in an instruction book. How's that? A little instruction book in this container. And then I'll uh, cap it all up. I can sit on it. Try to hatch it. How long do you think it'll take before this container, with the instruction book and all those pieces of metal, can turn this into a model car or, or a model anything. In fact, what will happen as we just sit and look at this container? Absolutely, yeah, it will deteriorate. Absolutely nothing except it will deteriorate. What about this? This doesn't breathe in the normal sense of breathing. This is an egg. This comes from a white leghorn because it's white. I used to raise white leghorn chickens. I used to joke about that. I, I raised chickens, I don't know really why, 
I think something happened in my brain once and I, I so we bought all these chickens and I think by the time I was through I was paying about three dollars a dozen for my, for my eggs but that's, <laughs> fortunately though we still have the, the chicken house and Laura uses it for a tack room but anyway here's an egg this egg contains the material and the instructions to build a chicken think about that this has got a bunch of stuff in it it's a shell it's a case and it has stuff in it including an instruction book but it will not do anything this is a case it's a shell it's got stuff in it including an instruction book DNA right? There are various parts of this egg. When you open an egg up, if it's a fertilized egg, there's a little white glob. I'm not even going to try to use the technical terms for this. I'm, I'm a physicist, not a biologist. A little white thing sitting on top of the yolk, that becomes the chicken. The yolk provides the, the food necessary for it to become a chicken. There's a, a, a layer inside the eggshell itself that takes care of the waste products. If a chicken pops out, if you ever watch a chicken being hatched or a duck being hatched, it's kind of cute. But you'll see the, the, the waste from the, the little bird is stuck to the outside of the eggshell. So this thing, which does not breathe, is a case that contains information. It contains material. And it contains everything that it needs to become a chicken and given enough time, and I don't know what it, how many days it takes, what, 30 days or so, it will become a chicken. Think about that. Think about how ludicrous it is to believe in an evolutionary process that just having the material and the instruction book by itself in a container does not give you a car, or a model car, or a model anything, why in the world should a little shell evolve without any designing intelligence containing all that is necessary to produce a chicken? What came first is a, is a common question, right? The chicken or the egg? Well, do you know what the evolutionary answer is? The egg came first! Well, that is... Well, I, I hate to... I'll say it. That's stupid! It's just plain dumb. The egg didn't come first. There's an easy answer to that. The Bible says that God created birds with the ability to lay eggs and make new chickens or new birds. So the egg didn't come first. If you're a biblical person, you understand that the bird came first. But think about how silly it is to suppose for a moment that a shelled container could all by itself generate a bird. Romans chapter 1. God says, you are without excuse. Because my glory is revealed in what is around you, you are without excuse. And every single one of these people that teaches evolution is someday going to stand before the Creator that made the egg and ask them, didn't you ever have an omelet? What's the matter with you? The egg. The egg is a powerful testimony to the glory and power and wonder of God. Not only does it contain the stuff, but it will actually do it. It will actually fabricate itself. This has all the stuff, maybe not all, but it has stuff in it. This has, there's enough stuff here to build something, but it won't do it by itself. But inside this little egg, there is the, the instructions, the stuff, and it will do it all by itself. Now, by the way, this one won't. This one is, 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 is hard-boiled so that it won't crack. I wouldn't want to... <laughs> Thank you. Whales. This morning we're going to talk about whales. Actually, what I intended to talk about, I forgot my globe. I wanted to talk about Uranus, the planet Uranus. It's not, by the way, pronounced Uranus. It's Uranus. Next week we'll talk about that. But that's a fascinating subject. But I left my world home. I have a globe. I forgot to bring it with me this morning, and I need my globe for that. But whales, 
I was going to do this the week after. One of the things that is so remarkable about science is the way that science duplicates creation or that science copies creation. We really can't come up with a better idea. And if you remember, the foundational belief system behind evolution is that it's all accident. Well, we don't design things by accident. So if it's all accident, the way a whale looks should not be significant to us as scientists. But as it turns out, if you noticed, I never really paid much attention, but it shows a little picture of a whale here. But Whales don't tend to be covered with barnacles too much. There are a few. They have a few barnacles on them, but they have a very remarkable skin. They have a skin that has a unique design. It has a structure that little rivulets in it that you can't even see. I've never rubbed a whale skin. I don't know. I guess you probably could. Some of them have washed up in a few places nearby. But they have a structure that kind of prevents barnacles from sticking to them anyway. All the slimy grass and stuff. You look at a boat that's been in the ocean for a while and, and it's horrible. They have to bring them in about every year because it reduces their speed significantly, increases their fuel consum consumption significantly because of the barnacles and grass and stuff that grows on it. It doesn't happen on whales. And yet whales live in the water and they don't move very, very fast. In addition to the little riblets in the skin, they have little tiny pores and a gel oozes out. The gel that oozes out is, is an antibacterial or antiparasitic thing. It's a, it prevents the larva bugs from growing on the whale's skin. So what's the point of all that? Well, whales have two things that prevent them from being covered with barnacles, which would make it very difficult for them to live in the ocean and move around very quickly. Their skin is designed with little ridges in it, like ruffles, potato chips, I guess, that you can hardly see, that prevent things from growing onto them. And they also have, in case something does manage to get a start, they have something that oozes out of their skin that kills the bacteria, that actually is an antiparasitic, kills the parasite that's trying to attach itself. And then on top of that, they, scientists now believe that when whales go up and crash down into the water, what they're doing is knocking off those things that have started to attach themselves. Well, what's the point? Well, the point is, right now, we don't have a decent chemical that you can paint on the bottom of a boat. Anyone that's been in the Coast Guard or the Navy or that's hung around the sea coast like we do here, I used to put my boat in the water and in a matter of a month, it used to, I only had a small outboard on it when I was a kid and I could hardly move. After about 30 days of sitting in the creek over here at Granite Point, I used to have my boat moored over in Granite Point in one of those little creeks. We don't have a paint. And I had put copper paint on it. We don't have a paint that stops stuff from growing or attaching to vessels in the water. Well, now scientists are, are actually, this is according to an article in New Scientist magazine in December of 2001. Scientists are working on a paint that when it dries has little riblets in it and the paint itself will have in it an anti-parasitic gel, if you will, or a chemical that will kill parasites that will ooze out slowly as the boat moves through or sits in the water or perhaps moves through the water. So what they are trying to do to prevent the formation of stuff on the bottom of boats is develop a paint that looks like a whale. Isn't that awesome? Looks like a whale. With all of our intelligence and our design, we're trying to come up with something that duplicates what God did already. You see, the whale didn't form by accident. That's the bottom line. The, the, the foundational belief system of evolution is accident over long periods of time. You and I know better. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created God made everything. He made whales as whales. And he designed their skin so that barnacles couldn't attach to it. So think about that. As you see things and as you look at things, whatever magazine you're reading, whatever newspaper you're reading, none of the articles you'll read, unless it comes out of something like this, is going to give any credit to God. But as you read, you can certainly give credit to God. And you can see, learn to think in ways like they do here in, in Creation Magazine. And as you see something like this, oh look, they're developing a new paint that imitates a whale skin. That shouldn't just go over the top of your head. Think about what that is really saying. That the intelligence of man is trying to copy God. 
not an accident. They're trying to design a create what a creator has already done. Think about it. Thank you. Psalm 19, verse 1, but not yet. Uranus is a planet. Uh, we have not known a whole lot about Uranus. A guy named Herschel. In fact, I have uh, uh, an evolutionary book at home, a physics book called Herschel's Garden. Herschel was a Christian, by the way. Uh, he's an astronomer from a few years back, a few decades back. Was the first one to notice Uranus as a planet. It's one of our planets. It's quite large. 64 Earths would fill the globe of Uranus. Now Uranus poses a problem. Poses a problem. Let me see. I need uh... Janine. <laughs> You're perfect. Come up here. I need a sun. I don't mean a male sun. I mean a sun. Understand here? This is kind of like the Beauty and the Beast. We need something attractive to go along with myself here. But let's say Janine, stand right there. Okay, right there, perfect. Janine is the sun, all right? The big globe that heats us up and gives us sunburns and all that kind of stuff. Now, all planets go around, of course they revolve on their axis, but they go around the sun like this, right? With the axis perpendicular. That's essential. From a, an evolution standpoint, it has to be that way. It has to be. Because from the evolution standpoint, the entire cosmos was formed by this great big explosion. And this explosion caused all these particles to spin. Why does the Earth spin? Why does the sun spin? Why does the Earth rotate around the sun? It rotates around the sun because of an angular momentum and because there's nothing in space to prevent it. All the planets rotate around the sun like this, with the axis like this, except Uranus. Uranus rotates like this. Makes no sense. Uranus rolls around the sun. Now that blows the whole theory. It absolutely destroys the whole theory. If science is the search and quest for truth, for scientific truth, then you somehow have to explain this. And it's very difficult to explain. Why does Uranus roll around the sun instead of rotate and spin around the sun? Okay, you can sit down now. Thank you. So here's some of the... Well, I'll give you one of the, the solutions that they've come up with. Well, Uranus used to be like this because it had to be because when the Big Bang happened or whatever it is that put all of this stuff cosmically spinning in space, it had to be in the right direction. It couldn't be this way. It's totally physically impossible scientifically to be like this. It can't be. It can only be like that. So it must have got impacted, which knocked it over. Problem is, when you impact the ball that's spinning, you aren't just going to knock it over, you're going to knock it out of position. The most perfect orbit around the sun is Uranus. Absolutely, totally perfect elliptical orbit as it's supposed to be. Has not been knocked out of position. Its moons would be wrong if it were knocked out of position. But the moon spin as if it was actually created this way. It's a problem. It's a problem for evolutionists. It's not a problem for you. What does Psalm 19.1 say? The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Why does Uranus roll over like this? I don't know why God created it that way. <coughs> Maybe it's because he knew that there's a time coming that we would send a little satellite out and that we'd take pictures of it. Maybe he did it so that it would surprise us and startle us and shock us into disbelieving the lie of evolution. Maybe it has another function we haven't discovered yet. I don't know. But the bottom line is 
the more we discover... In fact, I'll read the closing comment from the man that wrote this article in Creation Magazine. It, was, it worked for NASA. He was a, a, has a bachelor's degree in, in engineering. And he says, In today's scientific age, one is often asked, how is it possible to be a Christian in light of all that science has discovered? We see that just the opposite is true. The more we learn, the more we see that indeed the heavens, along with all the rest of creation, do indeed declare the glory of God. Psalm 19.1. So think about that. The next time you're up and looking at, out in space, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> next time you're out in space, average high school kid on a homework night, right, out in space. With this. The next time you're thinking about or looking at the stars in heaven, all the planets rotate around the sun <coughs> like this, except one which rotates around the sun like this instead of like this. What an awesome, awesome thing. And that very motion is totally inexplainable, impossible from an evolution model, from an evolution presupposition. What a glorious God we serve. Thank you. Doing something right, I guess would be the title for the creation moment this morning. Uh, should you or should you not, in a public school system, teach creation? And that's, that's the question. Hmm? Should you or should you not? Well, if you don't teach creation, then you're being neutral, right? No, wrong. Interesting. I, I'm doing something very exciting for me, a little nerve-wracking, because I've never done anything quite like this before. I'm teaching at Hollis Center Baptist Church for a homeschool group that meets every Monday throughout the course of the winter, a course called Understanding Your Times. And the understanding of the times has to do with our worldview. And there are only two foundational worldviews. Creation is interwoven all through this in evolution. One is the worldview that God is not, that's evolution. The other is the worldview that God is. There's no middle ground. God either is not, and we evolve by accident, and that's what evolution means, or God is, and you are created. Well, which makes better science? Which is better education? Which builds smarter people? Well, there's a quote here, doing something right. There is a school in England, it's Emanuel College. It's public funded, unlike here in America, I guess many English schools are public funded. And this is reported in, in the, the Guardian, a London newspaper, in March 2002. Here's a quote from the principal of Emanuel College. And by the way, Emanuel College is upsetting England because their graduate score significantly higher year after year after year on every test you can think of, science and non-science. They're, they're the graduates at a very high level, not because they have higher IQs, but here's the quote. To teach children that they are nothing more than developed mutations who evolve from something akin to a monkey and that death is the end of everything is hardly going to engender within them a sense of purpose, self-worth, and self-respect. To that I say, Amen. Not only that, see, he's not a scientist. It doesn't make good science anyway. It doesn't make good science anyway. Now, there's been a big storm over this. There's a guy named Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is a zoology professor in England, and he has a, a become the leading enemy. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould was enemy number one to the church. Stephen Jay Gould died at the age of 50, unexpectedly, this year, just this year. Don't make yourself an enemy of God. I'm not going any further with that, but let me just say, do not make yourself an enemy of God. And when I say enemy, I mean enemy. He didn't want a single hint of creation taught anywhere. Well, neither does Richard Dawkins. And Richard Dawkins is, is uh, one of the people leading a, a, a real quest against Emanuel College. 
Uh, however, Prime Minister Tony Blair from England strongly defended, it says here, Emmanuel College. But I like this. This morning in our Sunday school, Janine shared with us, don't let age be an issue. If somebody young is teaching you something out of the scripture, accept it, because they're using the scripture. And because somebody has white hair or no hair, does not mean that what they say is full of wisdom. Here's a quote from the Bishop of Oxford, the Anglican Church in England, the Bishop of Oxford, a man who is old, a man who's been around, a man who was probably brilliant, and he was quoted here in, again, the, the Daily Telegraph of London. This whole article came from Nature magazine. I am dismayed that Christians would oppose evolution. Evolution, far from undermining faith, deepens it. Richard Dawkins, now public enemy number one after the removal of Stephen Jay Gould, Richard Dawkins said, and this is a quote now, I'm going to read the quote. With hindsight, it might have been better if we atheists had kept our big mouth shut and left it to the bishops to destroy Christianity. Richard Dawkins understands the teaching of evolution is the destruction of Christianity. And that's what I'm going to be doing in my course this year, the homeschool course. There are 10 students signed up for it at the high school level. Your worldview affects everything around you. And what is it that's changed? Why is it that we have abortion at a greater level than ever before? That we have premarital sex in high school higher than ever before? That we have kids actually scoring lower and lower on tests than ever before? Why is that? Why do we have an AIDS epidemic? Because of the worldview shift that has slowly been going on a long time ago. The creation people. Ken Ham, in fact, is the father of this, of this poster. I first saw this at Camp Maranatha. It showed two castles. The Christian castle and the evolution castle. Or the world's castle. The world's castle was built on evolution. The Christian castle was built on creation. But they didn't realize it. And they're shooting at the balloons of pornography, premarital sex, and anything, a pornog or anything else you could think of, homosexuality. They're, they're, the Christians are firing at those balloons. The evolutionists are firing at the foundation, at creation. It's now toppling. By the way, if uh, you listen, if you pick up Focus on a Family, Focus on a Family has spent $1.5 billion dollars in the last 10 years and they now realize that it was wasted they've lost in their building the family why is that why have they lost because quite frankly dear old Dr. Dobson is not a creationist he doesn't understand the real issue as Dr. Dawkins does who is an evolutionist the downfall of Christianity is the teaching of evolution. So I just want to share that with you. Should creation be taught in a public school like it is in England in this one college? If you go by the test scores, absolutely. If you go by pure science, absolutely. But if you're an atheist and your goal is the destruction of religion in America, as John Dewey was, who was the father of our education system, should creation be taught? No because it's very dangerous, because it's the truth. Think about that. Thank you. We talked about Adam and Eve, and I gave you, oh, I mean, hope I got it with me. Ah, I do. Gave you a problem. How long would it take to reach one million people, starting with Adam and Eve? One man, one woman. And I told you the answer would probably surprise you. I did this with the class that I'm teaching at, at uh, the homeschool class uh, under the lights program at Hollis Center. Monday, and one young lady did the calculation right in front of me. It's kind of neat, kind of interesting. And she came up with the right answer. I told her the assumptions. Here are the assumptions. We're going to assume a generation is 40 years. That's the biblical assumption for a generation. We're going to assume, which is ridiculous, the family size is 10. If you're going to live to be 930 years, 
you're not going to have just 10 kids. But we're going to assume the family size is 10, and that's not unreasonable. Uh, we have people in this church that have 10 children, so we're going to set them up as the norm, the standard. And we're assuming the average lifespan to be 800 plus years, and I got that out of chapter 5 of the book of Genesis. If you read chapter 5, it gives you the lifespans of a... The young, first one to die was 777... Well, okay, except Cain. I know some of you are thinking right away, wait a minute, Cain was... Okay, but other than Cain, 777 years old. Adam looked to be 930 years of age. Well, his, so here's the question. Is it possible, or is it ridiculous to think in terms of Adam and Eve starting the world off... And there being enough people by the time that Cain kills Abel that he would have a wife and run off and build a city somewhere. How long would it take to get a whole bunch of people on earth? Oh, the other assumption is, of course, Adam and Eve are created as full size, ready to reproduce immediately. Well, Dr. Morris from the Institute for Creation Research does the calculation shows us how to do the calculation. And you can make all kinds of assumptions. And, and one thing that he does, and I'm doing the same thing because my mind is getting spongy when I think about trying to do something else. We know Adam and Eve had more than 10 kids. But if you're going to go by generation to generation by generation, it's much easier mathematically to make a very simple calculation. It goes like this. If I can do this. So if Adam and Eve is two, and they have C boys and C girls, I'm going to assume five boys and five girls. So the, the, the number of people, the children that they have is two times C, five boys and five girls. And then it's two C squared, two C cubed, two C to the fourth. Get the picture? It's a sequence. And it goes on every 40 years. Now. The other catch is that since nobody's dying, they keep adding on. So that's the calculation. So how long do you think? Anybody do it? Nobody did it? In 300 years, there would be over a million people on the earth. In 300 years. In 300 years... Adam is a young adult. In 300 years, that's equivalent to myself being 30 years old or yourself being 30 years old. Because Adam lived to be 930 years of age. And in fact, as you read chapter 5 of the book of Genesis, you find out children are being identified there. So-and-so was 140 when he had somebody and, and somebody else was 135 when he had somebody or something like that. And that doesn't mean those are the only children that they had, of course. There are key names that are identified in Scripture. That's the way that, 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 that's the, way that the Bible was written. There are key names that you can follow through. So on that assumption, as a matter of fact, in 340 years, there would be 4,882,812 people. That's assuming that nobody had more than 10 kids, which is ludicrous. My grandmother was one of 16. My grandfather was one of 13. So if there were some Franco-Americans here, then there would be some even larger families than that. Wouldn't take long. One thing that evolutionists and creationists agree on, there were not a whole bunch of people created all at once or popping up all at once. That, that's crucial. At the University of New Hampshire, 12 years ago when I was doing a, a, some creation workshops at, at UNH, there was a professor there named Tom Coker. Dr. Coker is world famous. He had received an, an international award about 15 or 16 years ago for discovering the African Eve. He's the one that came up with the African Eve. That all of humankind on the face of the earth today could be traced back to one woman. I don't know if he's still at UNH or not, but I, one of the graduate students uh, one of the Chinese graduate students had Dr. Coker as a professor. So you see, that's a, that's 
Nobody, nobody thinks there's a whole bunch of people all at once that plop down. That, that's key. You need to remember that. Because they couldn't possibly evolve. Because the, the, the possibility, probability for evolution is so tiny that it, it, couldn't, it couldn't happen. Evolutionists understand that. But many of us, in our attempts to try to comprehend the Bible, uh, and, and there are some scientists that are quite well known that are doing that. A guy named Hugh Ross from California is a theistic evolutionist. He believes that, uh, that there was an ancestor to man, that there was a gorilla that fell out of a tree, started walking around, looked a little bit like us, and then God came and whoo, breathed the breath of life into him. Problem with that is that requires God to have been saying in the book of Genesis, of course, that death and dying was good. Because remember, when God created, he said it was good. So that's ludicrous. We don't, we don't deal with that. But many people don't do the math. It's not that unreasonable. In fact, the population here is far too big. One of the proofs of a young earth, and geneticists do this using a family size of two, starting 6,000 years ago with Adam and Eve. Uh, there's not enough wars, not enough pestilence, not enough bubonic plague, not enough of anything to have as few people as we have on the earth today. There should be a lot more. For the earth to just be 6,000 years old, there should be a lot more people than 6 billion. We've only reached 6 billion. Well, that's unbelievable. There should be 6 Kabillion, and kabillion is a very big number. That's a... So I hope that as you think about this, you realize that you're not coming from a position of foolishness to believe that Adam and Eve were real, and that Adam and Eve were the first two human beings on earth. You're coming from a position of mathematical strength, and I should say, I suppose, it's not one million by the year 300, it's or by three, after 300 years, it's one million less one. Of course, you've got Cain, who killed Abel. But seriously, it's a very easy calculation to show. It's almost tragic to think of, of the churches and the theologians that talk about theistic evolution as if it was real, that have destroyed the Word of God, that have smashed the Word of God by saying, oh yeah, I believe in evolution and I believe in creation. Excuse me? You know what that's saying? I hope you're aware of what that is saying. That's saying, I'm an atheist, but I believe in God. It's called an oxymoron. You cannot put those together. The only reason that I suspect that any human being on the face of this globe could say, I believe in God and I believe in evolution, is they don't understand what evolution teaches. Remember what evolution teaches. Once upon a time, nothing became a rock, became a frog, became a princess with no divine designing intelligence whatsoever. That's the teaching of evolution. 100% by accident. That's classical evolution. God is removed from the picture. You cannot believe in God and evolution. It is impossible. If you don't leave here with anything else today, please leave with that. You cannot believe in evolution and God. They are mutually exclusive, as we say in mathematics. There is no overlap. They are exclusive events. By definition, what theistic evolutionists do is change both the definition of evolution and the definition of creation, and thereby lose respect from both sides. Nothing does the gospel more damage than a theistic evolutionist because nothing looks more stupid to the world than a theistic evolutionist. Because an evolutionist knows when somebody says, I believe in evolution, but I believe in, in creation. They know that, well, this guy is brainless. Can, can I be blunt? Absolutely, totally brainless. He doesn't understand either creation, nor does he understand evolution. I'm coming across very strong for a reason. I want you to get it. I want you to get it good. Evolution, creation, exclusive, cannot be put together. Adam and Eve, real people. One man, one woman. Lived for 900 years. 
if Cain slew Abel after 300 years, there's a million people on the earth. Now, it wouldn't take a million people to cause Cain a lot of trouble. It would only take about 180 years to get to the population of Bidifid and Sarko. Now that could cause a lot of trouble. Cain would have to worry if there were 40,000, 40, 50,000 people on the earth, wouldn't he? He'd have to worry then too. Mathematically, it's a very simple thing to figure out. Adam and Eve are real people. One man, one woman. Lived to be 900 years old. Mathematically, assuming, and it comes from a book called Scientific Creationism, the simple formula. And it's much more complex than that. But that's the simple way to look at it. Mathematically, in 300 years, there would be over a million people on the earth if each had five boys and five girls. Every 40 years. And the other thing that I can't stress too much, and I'm so tired of hearing it, you cannot mix creation and evolution together. If nothing else comes out of the years of preaching that I do here, I hope there's not a single human being from the age of two to the age of 200 in this church that does not understand they cannot, by definition, be put together. It is impossible. Evolution means no God by those that developed it and by those that defend it. And creation means God created. And we do know how he did it. He told us exactly how he did it. God spoke. And there it was. Can you picture that? What a beautiful thought. Chuck Swindoll struck me a long time, years and years ago. He, had, he said, can you picture what God was doing? God made a, made a daisy. He spoke and there was a daisy. And he said, wow. And then he spoke again and made, a, made more daisies. And that's how he did it. He spoke it into existence. He's God. And you say, well, I don't understand how that works. Good. If you did, then I'd have to worship you. And there's nobody here. You're all nice people, but there's nobody here that's worthy of worship. Right? So keep that. Adam and Eve, real people. A million people in less than 300 years. And Cain might not have slain Abel until six or seven hundred years had gone by. We don't know. Adam and Eve lived to be 900 years old. Remember that. That's point number one. And point number two this morning. Please understand evolution, creation, big wall, Berlin wall between them. You cannot mix them together. To try to mix them together shows an ignorance of either the creation position or the evolution position, or both. And I cannot say that too strongly. A total, complete ignorance of either of the positions or both. They are mutually exclusive. We're going to continue in this vein uh, for the next few Sunday mornings, talking about uh, where did Cain get his wife, for example, and other things along those lines. Thank you.